I'd like to welcome you all. This meeting is being recorded. Okay, starting in, <laughs> I'd like to welcome you all to the uh, February 2023 meeting of the Southwest Florida Astronomical Society. I'm Brian Risley, the president. I'm going to turn things over to uh, John, who's our program committee chair and uh, also the treasurer. So see him produce. Uh, good evening. Uh, welcome to the new 2022-2023 annual speaker series. Tonight, our speaker is Dr. Thomas Prettyman, who is a senior scientist at the Planetary Science Institute. Dr. Prettyman received his PhD in nuclear engineering from North Carolina State University in 1981 and joined PSI in 2007 after 14 years as a member of the technical staff at the Los Alamos National Laboratory. His main research interests emphasize planetary remote sensing using nuclear spectroscopy and includes space physics and cosmic ray studies. He is involved in the development of instrumentation and mission concepts for planetary science and, anal and analyze and interprets data acquired by missions to the moon, Mars, Mercury, and small bodies such as the main belt asteroid 4 Vesta and the dwarf planet Ceres. Current missions include Psyche, a mission to maintain belt, to, to main belt asteroid 16 Psyche and Lunar H map, a small satellite mission to explore the lunar South Pole. Dr. Prettyman's talk tonight is entitled From the Beginning of Time to the Center of the Earth, Exploration of the Asteroid Belt. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Prettyman. Thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you this evening. Uh, thank you for having me and happy Groundhog Day. I'll get started with my presentation and I've just got to share my screen and then start my slides and then we'll do a quick video and audio check just to be sure uh, we're uh, on the right track. Okay, so at this point, um, I think I'm sharing my screen and you should see uh, a photo I took of a lunar eclipse. Is that something you see? Yep. Okay, so it sounds like you can hear me. Um, and now I'm sharing my title slide. Can everyone see the title slide? Yes, okay, good. Uh, there's some chance that uh, internet will cut out, uh, so <laughs> we'll do our best, um, but uh, uh, let's go ahead and get started. So the title of my talk is From the Beginning of Time uh, to the Center of the Earth. Uh, this is after uh, two, uh, uh, one that was a film, kind of an educational film uh, that I saw in my youth, and the other was kind of a Hollywood movie I saw uh, in my youth, and both are sort of representative of uh, missions that um, I, I have been on. Uh, the NASA Dawn mission uh, visited the two largest bodies in the main asteroid belt, and that's kind of uh, my uh, journey to the beginning of time uh, 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 subject. And then uh, asteroid uh, 16 Psyche is thought to be uh, the remnant core of a, a small body uh, that might be exposed by collisions and uh, that represents the NASA Psyche mission. Uh, you could just as well call this talk um, uh, from a blurry item, blurry objects in a, an astronomer's telescope to geologic worlds. So that's kind of a theme of this talk as well. And the title slide shows um, an early uh, uh, image of asteroid Vesta in, in the middle as taken by uh, the Dawn mission as we were approaching Vesta. And that's compared on the left to the best um, the Hubble Space Telescope could do. And on the very right uh, to uh, the very, very detailed um, composite images that we have of asteroid uh, four Vesta from the Dawn mission. And uh, this work is uh, funded by a number of projects uh, that are listed below, but primarily I'll be talking about Dawn and Psyche. So uh, one of the places I like to start um, is just uh, uh, this photograph that I took uh, when I was in Chile uh, a while back, um, and it's of the uh, uh, southern sky at night, and you can see the Milky Way going across the sky, and you can see dense uh, clouds of gas 
superimposed uh, on top of the star field. And so uh, if you were an Incan, uh, you would have looked at the sky and saw this, and you might imagine some of the shapes were like animals. Uh, for example, there might be a llama present in the image. Uh, so they, they thought that um, the dark cloudy shapes uh, were, were like living uh, things. Uh, and uh, the luminous uh, connect the dot patterns that we're used to, uh, you know, they, they, they thought of as, as being kind of inanimate. So it's a nice picture, but it's also kind of a picture of beginnings because in these uh, clouds, uh, these are giant molecular clouds, and um, this is where you have a uh, star forming going on, uh, uh, young stellar objects uh, that would become similar uh, in size to our sun. So uh, I like showing this one along with the uh, picture that I took. Uh, this is um, the Carina Nebula seen by the James Webb Space Telescope. And uh, it's a, a giant molecular cloud. Uh, it's got some interesting patterns where you can see the clouds denser. Uh, there are all these interesting columns and uh, not shown or maybe partially shown is a giant star that's uh, illuminating this region. And uh, giant stars have very short lives uh, and uh, they go supernova and they tend to pelt uh, the molecular cloud with uh, radioactivity. A lot of it's uh, short lived. And uh, this goes, one is the, uh, the, the giant uh, star is basically uh, compressing uh, the, the cloud and triggering the formation of, of stars. And uh, the other thing that happens is they pelt the uh, cloud with radioactive debris. So you have a heat source um, that's present in, in the gas that uh, comes together to form stars and planets in this region. So uh, this is thought to be the environment in which our sun uh, formed, something very similar to this here. And so now we can start talking about uh, the origin of planets and the origin of asteroids. Asteroids originated nearly 4.5, uh, 4.6 billion years ago, um, you know, as our, as our young sun fired up. And they represent the building blocks of planets. Uh, a lot of them are broken up into tiny, tiny little fragments, but there are a few that survive nearly intact to this day. And we're going to talk about those. Uh, the importance of asteroids to society includes science, uh, planetary defense, and they might be uh, a potential resource for humans. Uh, just a timeline to sort of put things in context. Uh, this is, uh, you know, the uh, sun uh, starting form 4.6 billion years ago. Uh, within 100 million years, uh, you had the formation of Predator. Uh, followed by a uh, moon forming impact. Uh, and then um, as time went on, uh, we have uh, evidence for uh, life on earth uh, and the rise of uh, animals such as ourselves. And then in recent times, uh, there's evidence in the geologic record for uh, mass extinctions. Uh, typically there are five that people think of as the big ones and there are probably a lot more small ones as well. The very latest of these extinctions shown on the very, very far right, you know, around 65, 70 million years ago, is thought to uh, be the result of um, a uh, giant impact uh, you know, object that was um, uh, maybe six miles across whacking into the earth and uh, producing uh, global devastation uh, resulting in uh, the uh, demise of the non-avian dinosaurs. Uh, more recently, uh, we from time to time had uh, fairly large uh, impacts um, uh, in recorded history. The one depicted up on the top is um, the Chelyabinsk impactor. That would have been something like a 10 to 20 meter size object entering Earth's atmosphere and detonating, and it produced some damage. So people think of, um, uh, asteroids um, in terms of being a potential threat. Uh, they also provide an immense amount of information about the early conditions in, in the solar system. And so we're going to talk mainly about that. Uh, but 
just so uh, we understand the context, um, here's, here's kind of a movie illustrating the inner solar system as we know it today. So you've got uh, the uh, you know four inner planets, the terrestrial planets, um, so Mercury through Mars, and between the orbits of Mars and uh, Jupiter, which is the outermost rotating object, uh, there are thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of uh, small bodies that have been discovered. Uh, these, these are the asteroids. And I've plotted two of the orbits. Uh, these are the two most massive objects in the main belt. Uh, they're shown in white. And they're the orbits of uh, four Vesta, which is the inner one, and uh, one Ceres, which is actually not classified as an asteroid, it's a planet. And so the Dawn mission actually went and visited these objects and, and saw them up close. A little bit of context, uh, I have a definition of an astronomical unit. Um, uh, from practical terms, uh, as someone who's worked on spacecraft missions, the main thing to understand is you want to communicate uh, with something, you know, an, a robot that's out in the asteroid belt and you're on Earth, uh, well, you need to understand that that's, you know, could be several astronomical units away and it takes a while for the radio waves to arrive. It's not instantaneous. And then it takes a while for uh, the, you know, radio waves from the spacecraft to get back to Earth. And so you have sort of a, a two-way light time that we think of. And uh, for that reason, um, you know, these robotics missions that we have, the uh, spacecraft tend to have autonomous features and capabilities. Uh, and you also have to be very, very patient in terms of understanding uh, uh, what the uh, robot might be doing. So uh, just a little bit of information, uh, this, this uh, you know, ring uh, that has lots and lots and lots of small bodies, uh, it's, it's very interesting. Um, it uh, is actually a mass depleted region in the solar system. And it's a place where, you know, planet processes started. Um, you know, in other words, you know, you could have started the formation of uh, planetary embryos, which would have grown into uh, a, a, a terrestrial planet if it were not for the fact that Jupiter, which was quite massive, uh, formed nearby very early. And uh, gravitational forcing by Jupiter uh, scattered uh, many of the small bodies out of this region uh, and uh, it resulted in uh, a mass uh, uh, depletion. The, the total mass of the asteroid belt is much less than that of the Earth's moon. Uh, but there are thousands and thousands and thousands, actually hundreds of thousands of them, as you'll see in a second. So let's have a look, uh, a little bit more detail. Uh, this plot is um, maybe the most complicated one that I'll have in my uh, uh, chart stack. And it's just showing all of the uh, uh, known asteroids in the main asteroid belt plotted as a function of uh, distance from the sun. And what's plotted is their uh, orbital inclination. And that is how tipped the plane of their orbits are relative to um, the plane of the ecliptic, which is uh, the plane in which the planets wander. And um, you see all kinds of beautiful patterns in, in this chart. Uh, there are gaps, like the one at two and a half uh, astronomical units, and there's some further out. Uh, these tend to be um, uh, places where uh, Jupiter's orbit is resonant uh, with um, the uh, motion of the asteroids in that part of the belt. Uh, the inner uh, object for Vesta uh, has a class of um, asteroids that are associated with it. They're known as the Vestoids. They look very similar to each other uh, in, uh, you know, in, if you look at uh, uh, an optical spectrum, a reflectant spectrum of them. And they may, uh, in fact, they are thought to have originated from Vesta. Some of them are precariously close to um, that inner gap, uh, the 2.5 um, uh, AU gap. And when you get into that gap, uh, Jupiter's forcing uh, can fling you uh, into the inner solar system or out of the solar system entirely. 
And uh, as a result, uh, we think we have a lot of meteorites. These are rocks coming from the sky that are representative of these bodies that we can analyze in the laboratory. It's very powerful. Uh, there are also objects further out, uh, indicated Ceres, Pallas, Hygieia, Themis. Um, one of the concepts to understand is that the snow line, uh, this would be the place where you could condense water ice to build planets, uh, would have been outside two astronomical units and would have drifted around in the vicinity of the asteroid belt. For various reasons that I don't want to go into here, uh, the asteroid belt is basically a jumbled mix of wet bodies, so icy bodies, and bodies that are dry, some of which um, underwent uh, igneous processes, volcanic processes. Um, and they were able to do that very early in the solar system due to the presence of the radioactive material that I mentioned earlier, okay? So there's a gradient um, of composition uh, across the belt. The Dawn mission enabled us to visit uh, uh, properly an intact uh, planetary embryo. Uh, planetary embryo is kind of the building blocks of the larger planet planets, uh, and it's thought to be very, very old. It underwent igneous processes, um, so volcanic type processes. Ceres is the diametrical opposite. Uh, it's wet, water rich, and um, it would have experienced aqueous processes. So we'll talk a little bit about that as we go forward. So this just shows uh, lots of evidence for um, water in the main belt, ice and organic matter. It's a rather interesting place. The objects that are there are uh, very, very old. Uh, the main belt uh, early on uh, was a collisional environment. That's before it became mass depleted. Uh, you had perhaps lots and lots of collisions going on. And in fact, if you make a plot of the distribution of asteroids as a function of their diameter, uh, it, it, it looks like a power law. And it's almost as if um, the objects that went into the belt, that formed in the belt, were subjected to almost like a, a ball mill type process. So they were ground up by collisions. Some of them survived. Um, one series is um, round. It's a dwarf planet. It's a dwarf planet because it's in hydrostatic equilibrium or nearly so. Uh, Vesta might have started out being in hydrostatic e equilibrium when it was a molten body, okay? But it froze and it was battered out of round um, by collisions. But it's still nearly intact, uh, and um, it's it's an interesting object to study. And then the other object we'll talk about is 16 Psyche. You can see the relative sizes, and uh, Psyche uh, is um, thought to be uh, the stripped core of um, an object like Vesta. So just the center remains. So. Uh, there are a lot of small body miss missions. Uh, you might wonder if you're looking carefully at the low end diameter on this chart, why it drops off. Uh, that is likely just selection bias. We just haven't seen the objects that are there. And if we look more closely, that power law, you know, that looks like it decreases with diameter would probably keep going up. Um, there have been a lot of asteroids that we visited um, on uh, uh, missions that are small. Uh, Itakawa, Ryugu, Bennu, most recently uh, Didymus, and uh, some larger bodies, uh, Lutetia, Ida, and Eros. Uh, they're not round. <laughs> they're, they're, and they also tend to be uh, in microgravity. So uh, you, you can, uh, you know, uh, if you're good, good at leaping, you could stand on the end of Eros uh, on the right and uh, get a good running start and escape uh, uh, Eros. So uh, lots and lots of interesting stuff going on in the world of asteroid re research um, that you can look into. Um, Near-Earth asteroids, I just started this in just to represent um, the idea of asteroid mining. It's kind of futuristic, uh, kind of out there. Um, uh, these green objects that are rotating around the orbit of Earth, <clears throat> um, near the orbit of Earth, uh, these are, these are uh, Apollo, uh, more asteroids um, that could be reachable uh, with very low delta V uh, by uh, a spacecraft. 
and uh, uh, could be the subject of study uh, by uh, human explorers. And then there's a, a kind of whimsical picture up on the right uh, illustrating uh, some asteroid mining activities. That's all I'll say about that. So let's move on. So uh, I just want to introduce the concept of planetary building blocks. So when you know, the, the uh, sun began to form, it was surrounded by a disk of, of gas. And um, the uh, gas and dust in this disk uh, would have uh, clumped together and the clumps would have clumped together and they would have basically gone into growing small bodies, maybe a thousand kilometers in diameter like Vesta and Ceres. And uh, uh, later these bodies uh, could have grown to form uh, 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 the planets. So um, what's really interesting, again, going back to the idea that the, the, the dust cloud would have been enriched in short-lived um, radioisotopes from a nearby supernova, uh, the earliest magmas that were formed in our solar system, uh, those occurred uh, about 10 million years after uh, our sun fired up. Uh, so uh, if you, you have an object that's being heated, it can completely melt uh, or partially melt, and uh, uh, the heavier elements will sink towards the center to form a core. And uh, Vesta is kind of like a terrestrial planet in that it's believed to have a core, uh, a mantle, and a crust. So uh, formation of the Earth, just to drive this idea home where you have accretion of um, uh, growth by uh, accumulation of smaller bodies, uh, Earth would have had, uh, the proto-Earth any would have, Earth anyway would have had a uh, uh, magma ocean, and you know there's a Vesta-sized object falling into uh, you know, the the uh, proto-Earth, and you can see processes happening in the interior. Uh, formation would have been gradual, uh, and uh, big impacts uh, uh, would have produced large-scale melting. Again, heavy metals, you know, uh, sinking to the center, forming a core, which is very important to us. So Earth's interior as we see it today, uh, we have the presence of an iron core uh, inferred from gravimetry starting in the 1770s with the Shahalian uh, experiments. And um, you have very, very detailed measurements today uh, with uh, gravimetry and uh, seismic measurements uh, supported by geochemistry and other observations. And we have a lot of uh, information about the interior structure of, of the Earth from, from those measurements. The lower right table is just a, um, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, the PREM, the preliminary reference Earth model that um, is, is interesting to look at. If you think about it, there's a large, the core itself has two parts. It has an inner, inner metallic part, and then it has um, uh, an outer liquid part um, that's, uh, that's freezing. And um, uh, you can think of uh, this, this the, the, the uh, outer core as, as Earth's largest ocean, deep beneath our feet. So I think I've covered that. Uh, the core itself is mostly iron nickel with a dash of light elements. Uh, we do, because we have this process where you have um, you know, the, the liquid metal uh, freezing, um, uh, you end up generating heat. Uh, and, you, and, and motion of the fluid in the uh, uh, outer core, uh, inducing a dynamo, which was responsible for our magnetic field. And um, uh, there are some rotational effects that um, organize uh, eddies in, in this, this molten metal uh, that results in a coherent field. It's pretty cool. Think of that every time I look at my compass. Uh, and this just gives you a little bit more information about what the core might be made of, mostly iron nickel, but you also have um, trace elements. Um, and these are responsible in part for how the core behaves. We have a lot of information about the outer two layers of the core because we have volcanism that samples the mantle and we can look at the crust. And um, we believe that Earth is well represented in terms of its bulk composition by um, uh, the carbonaceous chondrite meteorites. And so you can do a simple balance to figure out what might be in the core. Uh, you know, so here's an example of where you might see mantle material. Uh, there are lots of places on Earth where you can do that. This one happens to be in New Mexico. 
And this was the Dawn team um, at Vesta gathered around uh, Serra de Coate, uh, which is a hill uh, with, with, um, that was um, eroded away by the Rio Puerco River, um, exposing a volcanic neck. And that neck contains xenoliths, uh, which are basically uh, 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 you know, basalts um, uh, with uh, mantle materials, um, ultramafic materials mixed in. It's pretty cool. You can go walk out there, pick up a piece of Earth's mantle, and look at it. So um, Dawn mission itself uh, launched in September uh, 2007, uh, had a gravity assist at Mars. Uh, basically, because the orbits of Ceres and Vesta are tipped relative to the plane of the ecliptic, you have to change the momentum of the spacecraft. And that's what the Mars gravity assist accomplished. Uh, it had some cruise phases that went to you know Vesta and uh, spent uh, a lot of time in close proximity orbiting it um, uh, you know, from May 2011 to August 2012, went on to Ceres and orbited that. And the mission ended um, back in uh, 2018 in November. So um, the uh, mission, uh, the launch vehicle uh, was a Delta II and um, the, the, the uh, Dawn spacecraft got around, you know, did the rest of the job uh, using uh, ion propulsion, so solar electric propulsion, large solar panels, uh, basically uh, gathering energy. And then you fling, you have an electrostatic system where you fling uh, xenon ions out the back of the spacecraft. And what's interesting is the change in velocity that we got from uh, this ion propulsion system was over a long, long period of time, continuous operation, about the same as the uh, Delta V uh, to get uh, the spacecraft out of Earth's gravity wall. So um, uh, it's, it's, it's really impressive, robust, reliable technology. Uh, just to reiterate, that's what we saw on the left uh, before uh, dawn, just a blurry patch of light. And there's a picture of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the launch itself. It was a, a, a beautiful launch. Um, uh, it was a long journey to launch. Uh, there's a list of things that uh, you know I remember encountering along the way. Uh, it's never easy to get a spacecraft um, uh, from concept uh, to completion, and Dawn was super successful in that regard. Uh, a wonderful mission, worked very well. And there it is going off into the uh, sunset, into the dawn. And uh, here are some pictures. Um, it's me standing next to the spacecraft in the white room, uh, just examining the gamma ray neutron detector just to make sure it was ready to go. Uh, and there's some pictures of the spacecraft um, uh, prior to launch. It's a, the, the solar panels, I think uh, wingtip to wingtip are about 65 um, uh, feet. And um, you can kind of imagine the spacecraft body being the size of an SUV. You can see the ion thrusters below. A lot of the interior of the spacecraft was occupied by um, a xenon uh, 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 and, and hydrazine fuel tanks. So there are um, three uh, payload instruments, uh, a framing camera, two, quantity two, uh, uh, visible infrared um, uh, spectrometer called VIR, and uh, uh, the gamma ray neutron detector, which is the only US uh, uh, part of the payload and then the ion thrusters. So really cool technology. Uh, so on the right in the pie chart basically is a diagram of what we think Vesta might look like inside. Iron rich core, ultramafic mantle, and then uh, a, a basaltic crust. So, you know, if you go to Hawaii and look at the basalts, you know, think of Vesta. And uh, what you're looking at here are uh, above the diagram with the arrows, are different representative materials, um, uh, meteorites that have fallen to Earth that we've been able to associate with asteroid 4 Vesta. These are the Howardite, um, Eucrite, and Diagenite meteorites. And uh, you're looking at thin sections of them as uh, viewed from, you know, with polarized light. And you can see all the little crystals. As you go deeper into the crust and into the mantle, uh, the crystals get bigger because it took longer for them to cool. And as you get closer to the surface, the crystals are smaller. And there's also uh, a material called Howardite, 
uh, which is thought to be um, representative of the very, very, very outermost surface of Vesta. Uh, it's a regolith breccia, it just means that it's um, different pieces of material uh, that have been pressed together, broken up and pressed together by impacts. And the little dotted line on the pie diagram represents um, the possibility that many of these meteorites uh, uh, you know, were ejected by one or more large collisions. Um, uh, why do we think that they're uh, representative of Vesta? Uh, well, we can look at uh, Vesta's reflectance spectrum as a function of wavelength, and uh, we can see very, very similar features. Uh, Vesta uh, telescopic observations are a near match to the meteorites that we have on the ground. Um, and then here's just a depiction of um, uh, a large impact. And on the left, this natural picture of Vesta Southern Hemisphere looks very, very much like what happens after uh, you simulate the impact uh, uh, with a uh, small body. Didn't break Vesta entirely apart, but it produced um, a large uh, mountain, uh, possibly the largest mountain uh, in, in the solar system. So, um, so because of Vesta's differentiated interior, we kind of think of it as the smallest terrestrial planet. Uh, gravity science provides constraints, just like the uh, gravity gravimetry measurements on Earth did back in the 1770s uh, on density and interior structure. Uh, data are consistent with an interior mass con, probably a core and we can estimate uh, uh, the size of the core. Uh, you know, it's maybe a little bit smaller than asteroid 16 Psyche. Uh, here are some false color images just showing compositional variations on the surface. Uh, crater Cornelia has dark deposits in it. These are probably exogenic. They're probably carbonaceous materials that uh, were part of the impactor and um, uh, occasionally get <clears throat> stuck to the surface. And then if you wanted to know what Vesta surface looked like uh, uh, with your eyes, uh, there's a true color image um, on, on the right showing a complex we call the snowman. We'll look into that a little bit more in a moment or two. Uh, since these are the craters, Marcia, Calpurnia, and Minutia. And uh, pretty much everything uh, on the surface of Vesta uh, per the IAU, uh, International Astronomical Union, uh, is named after uh, Rome and the Vestal Virgins. Continuing on uh, from the instrument that I flew, uh, you can see um, uh, a compositional index, just a global map uh, of, of compositional variations uh, based on nuclear spectroscopy, and that's compared with what the uh, infrared spectrometer saw below. Very similar results. And then on the right is um, quantifying um, uh, the potassium to thorium ratio that's shown for all the inner planets and Vesta. And you can see that um, the ratio for uh, Howardite uh, is very similar to that of what we measured uh, for Vesta. So providing a little bit more linkage between the Howardite, Eucrite, Diagenite meteorites and Vesta. Uh, there's also exogenic hydrogen on the surface. Uh, you know, the VIR instrument measured uh, uh, hydroxyl, and um, uh, the gamma ray neutron detector measured the concentration of hydrogen. And there's a little bit of hydrogen, more than we would expect if Vesta was just a basaltic world. And most likely, we're looking at exogenic uh, material that's uh, water rich that's been deposited on the surface. Uh, okay, here we are. This is uh, Marcia. We're doing a flyover. Hopefully you can see that. To me, Marcia looks like a uh, duck stepped on the surface of uh, Vesta. Now uh, you can see all kinds of interesting features. If you look closely, you can see dark materials in the wall in a layer. If you look at the center, you can see pits, it's a pitted terrain. And um, uh, a lot of the morphology is, is really, really interesting and possibly related to um, uh, features that we see on Mars and other impact craters. So this is just a look at the interior. Uh, the uh, I don't know if you can see my mouse or not, but uh, the center you can see all these pits. And the pits again uh, form on on Mars. There's also evidence for them uh, on Earth. For example, the Reese impact structure in Germany uh, uh, has uh, remnant pits. Um, 
So looking a little bit more closely into the walls of Marcia Crater, you can see some of the dark materials I mentioned, uh, which has water trapped in the mineral lattice as hydroxyl. And continuing along, one of the things I'd like to do all next week, I'll do it um, uh, for a class, uh, is to uh, do kitchen science experiments. And you can uh, simulate uh, uh, the uh, uh, emission of volatiles from an impact uh, by mixing uh, dry ice with flour. And you form pits. Uh, and I'll talk about how they form in a moment, but it, it never fails. And the pits look very much, that you see in the flower look very, very much like those you see in Marcia and Vesta. So what's happening? How do they form? Well, what happens after an impact is you have a lot of hot material on the floor of the crater. And mixed in with that hot uh, basaltic material are these hydrogen you know, bearing minerals. And they evolve water vapor and that water vapor has to escape the surface somehow. And it tends to do so along preferential paths, called escape pipes in this picture. And you basically get kind of a, a Bernoulli effect where uh, uh, dust and gas are coming out and uh, piling up the material around the pipe and mounds. And that's what we think happens. Um, uh, kind of rare process on on Earth, but that's probably because we don't have a lot of preserved impact basins, but it's, it's interesting process to study. Um, you also see on Vesta, like I mentioned, there was a giant impact and there's a big rebound peak that formed. And, uh, you know, it, 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 it's a, you know, very large mountain and it, there's a rim to the basin. You can kind of see it in the image on the right. Uh, I've got my cursor over it, if you can see that, and then the mountain, I've got my cursor over that. And uh, when this impact occurred, it nearly shattered and destroyed Vesta, but not quite. And what you ended up happening was shock waves propagating through Vesta and uh, producing tectonic features, which shown on the left are these ridges and troughs, which is a really interesting uh, process. And studies of these ridges and troughs uh, along with other data, reveal the presence of two large impact basins in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, uh, one older than the other. The youngest one is, is known as uh, Rhea Sylvia. Uh, and um, so um, uh, let's continue on. And one of the things, just getting back to this idea that um, you know the spacecraft mission can gather a lot more detail than you can with the telescope, uh, we have now this very super detailed geologic map, which I expect will get used by future missions. And uh, you can see um, uh, all kinds of compositional variations, lineated structures, craters, and things like that in this map. Very beautiful. I think you can find it on the Wikipedia page uh, if you wanna look at it in more detail. Um, so these are just some of the features that you see in a geologic map. And then the other thing you can do with crater counting uh, if, if you have a young region, you're going to have relatively few craters. Uh, older region will be heavily cratered, and um, there are relations you can use to go from crater density or crater counts uh, to age. And it, it's, it's fairly uncertain, but uh, you can see that we can divide Vesta's history into uh, uh, different uh, uh, time periods dating all the way back to the beginning of the solar system. And some of the names I've already mentioned, uh, Venenea was the um, uh, oldest of the two large impact basins that we've seen. And Rhea Sylvia is younger and Marcia, well, that's the one that looks like a duck's footprint. So um, it's, it's really kind of interesting what you can get out of this. So continuing on, I'm just gonna say a few words about uh, dwarf plant series. Uh, I, I quite honestly think series is, is just, an amazing place. It's water rich. Um, in fact, uh, if you uh, look at a diagram of all earth water, you know, all, all the water you can imagine in the oceans, uh, in, in the mantle, et cetera, you make kind of a ball of water, which is shown to the right. And then I have kind of a picture of Ceres, which is about 30% volume water. And I have its inventory of water on the left. Uh, 
Ceres is, is wet through and through, and it's experienced aqueous processing. And it does also have a differentiated structure, but it's differentiated for reasons other than uh, the ones I mentioned for Vesta. It would have, uh, it's unknown, but unlikely that it has a core. Uh, it probably has a rocky mantle and then an outer icy shell. And on the left, you can see uh, superimposed on a uh, series dark surface, uh, bright spots. And these bright deposits um, are very prominent. They're in a crater called Ocator. And uh, it, uh, these bright spots are basically uh, the result of cryovolcanism, where you have um, uh, heating either by impact or the presence of the subsurface uh, brine layer that's expressed itself uh, onto the surface. And you're looking at carbonates in the picture. Um, so it's a really quite an amazing place. It would be a really cool place um, uh, for astrobiology research if you wanted to understand more prebiotic chemistry and um, uh, how organic molecules survive and evolve uh, in uh, brine environments. Uh, so uh, you've got everything there that you need um, uh, you know, for uh, 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 you know, building complex organic molecules. Uh, you've got uh, the right elements. You've got an energy source. You've got the presence of water, uh, although um, the, the pH and uh, fugacity of that system might not support the development of life. It's still an interesting place to look at. Glaciers, mud volcanoes, cryovolcanoes, um, evaporites, and well, organic matter. We've actually detected organic matter, and we suspect that Ceres surface um, is actually rich in, in organic matter. Great target for astrobiology, maybe even better than the icy moons of Jupiter and Saturn, because those are high radiation environments and they're further away. Uh, Ceres is in the belt. Uh, fairly easy to get to, at least comparatively. So something to look forward to, hopefully, in a future mission. Series 2 has a geologic map that's shown here. Uh, and it has, um, I missed that one, sorry. It has uh, 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 also a chronology, although I haven't depicted it. So um, on to Psyche. Uh, what if you could look at a planet from the inside out? We certainly can't do that with our planet. But um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, asteroid 16 Psyche, which is in the outer belt, uh, might be a stripped core. So you can imagine a process where you had an object like Vesta that was partially molten uh, and um, its outer layers got stripped away by a collision, um, uh, you know, leaving a kind of a partially molten metal blob in space. You can kind of imagine that this blob would start freezing from the outside in, uh, unlike the Earth, by the way. And uh, you could have uh, conducting fluid on the inside with eddies forming a magnetic field. That magnetic field would be locked into the outer layers of the object as the object froze. And uh, you could have all kinds of really cool processes going on, like sulfur volcanism, which is depicted on the right. Uh, bottom line is you're going to freeze in whatever magnetic fields you had, and you should be able to go with spacecraft, look at it, and see what was going on. That might be a clue as to whether or not it was core or something else. Um, Waiseki, uh, largest, 10th uh, largest body in the main belt, uh, suggests the data we have on it so far suggests a largely metallic body, um, consistent with fairly high metal fractions, and it's accessible by uh, low cost. Uh, discovery mission. And that's what we're doing. Psyche spacecraft, um, it's uh, very, very much like Dawn. In fact, a lot of its heritage comes from the Dawn mission. Electric propulsion, slightly better system, uh, built by SSL Maxar. And um, there are uh, three different instruments, a magnetometer to measure the remnant fields, a gamma ray and neutron spectrometer, and also a multispectral imager. So very Dawn-like uh, uh, spacecraft. Um, just a little bit about the orbit, also a Dawn-like timeline. Now, I'll just say that this timeline is no longer correct, but it does give a good example of what we think is going to happen. Now you have launch, uh, a Mars flyby, uh, and then approach and capture by Psyche and uh, measurements of Psyche in different orbits. Um, 
orbital operations um, as they were conceived of last year. Uh, you have um, uh, outer orbits uh, where you know uh, you, you might be measuring uh, uh, with the multispectra camera, and you go in and you get uh, the magnetometry in a different orbit, and then uh, the green band going around the object is um, where uh, the uh, uh, gamma ray neutron uh, spectrometer would get elemental measurements. Uh, Psyche's orbit is tipped relative to the plane of the ecliptic, so illumination conditions are different than we would have seen on Dawn at best in the series, but uh, lots of planning has gone in to understand how, how to make these orbits work. Okay, uh, development, there's a picture of some of our team um, uh, back at Maxar at the very beginning, and you can see the spacecraft as it was delivered to JPL in March 2021. And there's more pictures of the team as the spacecraft is being built up. You can see its main antenna, all kinds of interesting components. And here it was uh, when we visited um, uh, kind of mid last year before it got shipped off to the Cape. Uh, but um, the spacecraft is at the Cape. Uh, we had some problems with flight software testing, so we weren't able to launch last year. Uh, but uh, we are still planning to launch. Uh, uh, launch has been postponed till uh, 2023, late 2023 uh, or, or 2024. So, um, uh, and with the new timeline, orbital operations would start in 2029. Okay, so blurry point of light as seen by an astronomer in this case. Um, this is a telescope in the backyard of Lindy Elkin Tantons. She's the PI. And um, uh, here's a picture of Psyche as uh, seen uh, uh, by uh, um, Mars HRSC. And um, here's um, shape models. Uh, so I don't want to give you the idea that our telescopic data is entirely uh, producing blurry things. Um, you actually can get a fair amount of information out of radar uh, and um, uh, light curves. And uh, some of the data is represented here. So we're getting better and better at understanding. As we go on, uh, there'll be more and more ground observations of, of Psyche. And then finally, um, the punchline here is that like Dawn at SN series, Psyche is going to transform 16 Psyche uh, from a blurry uh, patch of light into a geologic world. And it explores the interior of small bodies. And uh, it connects back to uh, Earth studies of, uh, uh, you know, studies of Earth's core and uh, uh, planetary cores in general. And uh, so that's kind of the, the punchline, a lot to look forward to. Uh, one thing I did want to leave you with uh, before I close, this is the last chart, is how to get involved. And if you look at the bottom, there's a uh, website you can click on at Arizona State University um, has a very good outreach program and there are lots of ways for students to get involved and for the public to follow along. And so I encourage you to do so. And with that, I'm going to thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, please let me know. I'm going to turn a little bit of lights on in here, guys. Okay, if you got a question, uh, come around and you can ask him. Oh. Uh, <clears throat> at the beginning, you mentioned the aluminum uh, heating, and it just raised a question in my mind. Any estimate as to how long before the solar system formed did the supernova uh, eject that uh, supernova event that created that aluminum? I mean, right. So it would have to be been uh, fairly uh, uh, soon, you know, within, you know, 100,000 years or so. I mean, the aluminum 26 has a, and, and iron 60 are the two isotopes. Uh, you can look up their half-lives, but they're, they're fairly short-lived. Um, hi, uh, a couple of questions. So the missions that, that you uh, showed going to uh, Ceres and uh, Vesta and, and uh, the uh, uh, Psyche, they're using remote sensing, right, from, from um, 
orbiting around them. If you can go into just what, what technologies are used, you know, spectroscopy, how, how do you capture that info? Then the other thing earlier on, you mentioned <clears throat> uh, asteroid Bennu, which I think is the OSIRIS-REx mission, which the, the material is going to come back into Earth, I think, this yeah. year. As to how important is it to be able to actually look at that material directly at, on Earth, as opposed to, you know, using the uh, sensoring technology that you have um, with, with spacecraft orbiting these objects? Let me start with your last question and go backwards because it's a lot of information to unpack and I'm not going to be able to do it full justice. But starting with the idea of how important is it to um, return samples? Um, and you asked also relative to remote sensing measurements. Well, anytime I can get a sample into a laboratory, uh, there's a lot more detailed information that I can extract you know, I can get isotopic information, um, you know, that, that uh, can provide clues about the timing of processes and how old things are. Um, it, it's just uh, what we've been able to learn about VESTA having um, the uh, association I mentioned between the Howardite, Eucrite, Diogenite meteorites uh, and um, VESTA is, it's immense. I mean, from, from the meteorites, uh, we really uh, uh, know that we're looking at uh, uh, objects that came from a differentiated body that melted or partially melted and then froze. Okay, so that's that's a lot of information. Um, and it's more than you would be able to sort out in some ways um, from uh, the remote sensing data. On the other hand, the remote sensing data really provides a, a different kind of information. Uh, for example, you can get uh, geomorphology uh, out of it and you can look at processes that would have occurred on a planetary embryo. And you can also put the meteorites into context. So um, all of that's really important. But now let's think about this a bit more. You know, what if, uh, well, let me think of it another way. Uh, the all of the meteorites that we have have been processed to some degree by the passage through Earth's atmosphere. And possibly while they were in situ, after they landed, uh, not all file finds or, 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 excuse me, falls are observed. And so it could have been some time between uh, and when you saw the fall and found the uh, meteorite, or maybe you just never saw the fall. A uh, good example might be uh, uh, Antarctic meteorites or meteorites you find in the desert in some parts of the world. And uh, so there's the opportunity for um, Earth processes to sort of get into the mix. Now, if you can grab a sample from a body uh, that you're also able to look at with remote sensing, you have the best of both worlds. You have something that hasn't been processed by the atmosphere, hopefully, um, and that you can take into the lab and it's representative of uh, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the object you're looking at it. And you also have context uh, with, with images, you know where you took the sample. So it's, it's a case in which remote sensing uh, and sampling uh, work nicely together. So it's really gonna be exciting to see, uh, you know, what comes out of, um, uh, the the uh, two most recent um, sample return missions. And uh, sample return mission for Ceres is something that community, I think, is keenly interested in. That would be really super cool. So um, that was that question. And then the other question is, um, how you know do you see the surface? And um, uh, of course, you, you can just take a photograph of it, right? So that would be your framing camera. Uh, on Dawn, the framing camera uh, had filter wheels, so you could um, select wavelengths to look at. Uh, so basically uh, uh, different wavelengths to take pictures of. Um, and from that, you can, uh, the color variations that you see uh, and the variations across the different bands sampled uh, provide clues about the composition of the surface. Uh, the infrared spectrometer uh, basically is looking at the uh, longer wavelengths and their actual features that you can see, uh, like the ones I show you uh, in, in a chart, 
uh, where you have like a ban, you know, suppression in the reflectance at uh, one micron and two micron uh, microns that uh, indicate the presence of uh, kind of a igneous basaltic surface. So um, the uh, uh, gamma ray and neutron detector, uh, that's, that's really interesting because what happens is cosmic rays are bombarding the surface. And um, when a cosmic ray hits, you get a, a, a shower, you basically bust apart nuclei in the surface and you produce gamma rays and neutrons. And the neutrons and gamma rays that are emitted and reach orbit, which are detected by the nuclear spectrometer, provide a fingerprint of the elemental composition. So the infrared um, spectrometer gives you mineralogy, sensitive to mineralogy, pyroxenes and olivines, for example, presence of hydroxyls. Uh, the gamma ray and neutron detector gives you elemental composition. When you have that, you can start piecing together a lot of information about the composition of the surface. And then with the other data you have, you can start to sort out um, uh, uh, what kinds of processes form the surface you're looking at. So I hope that answers your question. Anybody else have questions? I can't see the online group. Is anybody online that has questions? So um, in terms of, of uh, you know, you've got the uh, uh, the, um, the 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 mission that's launching next year. Over the next twenty years, what 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 kind of missions would you really like to see? Is it like the the astrobiology on series, or if you had your druthers, what what would you like to see uh, happen? Yeah, that's the one I want to see. <laughs> uh, I'm also involved in. Uh, other missions now, uh, uh, the the um, CLIPS uh, uh, commercial uh, uh, lunar payload um, uh, uh, service um, has uh, NASA payloads, and um, I'm I'm working on one of those. And uh, so uh, certainly exploring the moon is going to be uh, really interesting. Uh, I, I certainly will be interested in observing, hopefully, the Mars sample uh, return mission. Uh, that should be coming up. Um, uh, and there's just so many places uh, to see in the solar system. Uh, and, you know, just from the standpoint of uh, pure exploration, uh, it's a great time, uh, you know, uh, to, to, to be able to uh, observe what's going on and, um, you know, perhaps participate. But yeah, the series mission is one that I think would be super cool. Great, thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, I do want to uh, thank you for your presentation. Sure. I think everybody had a good time with it and all. So. Thank, thank you very much for, for having me and um, uh, we'll uh, be in touch by email. Um, by our count, we had uh, 22 in here and nine online. Gotcha. Thank you so much for that. And uh, we'll, uh, hope you have a nice rest of your day. All right. Thank so you. See you. <laughs> okay. See you later. Bye. Uh, you got to get the screen. Okay. All right.